Welcome to Infrastructure Provisioning with System Center 2012 R2. My name is Kenan Owens and I'm a Senior Product Manager on the System Center and Windows Server team, focusing predominantly on virtualization and building your private clouds. Now before I was on System Center team, I was at a competing virtualization vendor. So I've grown up in the virtualization space and seen how people have been able to really lessen the costs of building and deploying their infrastructure by using virtualization. And now taking that into the cloud is where our customers are going to see tremendous, tremendous cost savings because they're going to build that operational savings. So what we're going to talk about today in these multiple videos that we're going to have is we're going to talk about how you're really focusing on different tasks. When we built Windows Server and System Center 2012 R2, we're really focusing now on not just a particular product or a particular component. It's not just Virtual Machine Manager. It's not just Windows Server, but how all of these things work together. And so with infrastructure provisioning, you're really focusing on, one, how do I take all of these different physical pieces of resources, pull them together, and really build something for my organization that they can use? And we're going to split this into three different videos. The first one's going to talk about how we can use System Center to help deploy your compute, your storage, and your networking resources. So what we're here is we're really managing the underlying physical resources, bringing them under management by System Center, and then being able to use them for your cloud environment, which goes into the next video, where we're going to talk about how we can destruct all of the different resources that we have and construct them together into a private cloud. How we can take that cloud and we can divvy up these resources to the different individual stakeholders that need access to these resources. And then show you what you can do when you start pulling this out across clouds, where you're not talking about just on-premises, but maybe working with a hoster or something like that. And then lastly, our last video is going to talk about day-to-day -day operations. I have this cloud configured. I've deployed my compute storage and networking resources. I've built my cloud environments. How do I keep this thing up and running? How do I now deploy my services, those things that my customers were really interested in, onto this cloud set of resources? And pull that all together with the architecture re reference and how all this thing looks, um, the bits and bytes as far as you know VMM and all the things that are necessary to run within VMM. Because of the way we've looked at how organizations are functioning, they have different needs and challenges. When we talk about the infrastructure provisioning, what we're really focusing on are some of these particular needs, like how an organization can take all of this existing disparate types of resources that they have and pull them together into something that they can then pull out and divvy to, and just shout to all the different users that are out there. So what this means is that I want to be able to not only use my existing resources, but I want to be able to buy all these new cool whiz-bang features and um, servers that are out there with you know, the fast cards and RDMA or whatever, to those types of things, massive processors and massive amounts of memory, and integrate them into my environment as well. But I have, if I have all these different types of resources that are out there, how do I make sure that they're being utilized to the most efficiency to the most efficient way possible. The other thing is that what virtualization did for capital costs, private cloud and your cloud services are going to do for your operational costs. By adding in things like extreme automation and by adding in things like the ability to um, pool all of these resources together, I can more easily lower the operational cost of running this private cloud day to day, ensuring that I get the best amount of resources for my individual users. So when you look at all these needs and challenges that our customers have, it really focuses on these different topics that we've, um, we've talked about and we're going to be talking about today. And in this first video, we're going to be focusing on the deployment and the management of your compute, your storage, and your networking resources. But before I go into that, one of the cool things about um, System Center is that multiple different components of System Center work together to help you build your environment and ensure that you have the resources available to um, 
to build these clouds. But before I even go into the one that we're going to focus mostly on in these next few videos, um, which is Virtual Machine Manager, let's go do a quick little tour of VMM just to see a little bit about what it looks like so that when I start talking about things later on, you kind of have a grounding as to what it is and where we look at. So right now I'm going to switch over to the video, I mean to the demo. And this demo will be um, on one of our systems here. So let me flip over to it. So in this demo here, I'm going to just quickly give you a tour of Virtual Machine Manager. And the reason I'm just going to be showing you Virtual Machine Manager in this demo today is that for the most part, most of the things we do in infrastructure provisioning are going to be done through Virtual Machine Manager. I'm not going to have to go out to all these different other systems. So first of all, the main focus of your application, what you want to get to is you want to have these services and these clouds. Now, a cloud is an abstraction of your physical resources. And we'll talk about that later on in the um, videos today. But the cloud is where you're going to keep your different virtual machines. And I can have different clouds for different environments, like my development environment, my production environment, maybe my US environment, or my Europe, or my Asia Pacific environment. And the cloud is where I'm going to aggregate all those underlying physical resources. Now, inside a cloud, it's made up of different hosts. And my hosts host the virtual machines. And those hosts can be Hyper-V hosts, or VMware hosts, or Citrix Zen server hosts. And inside the host, we're going to host VMs and services. And we'll talk about services later on, so I'll focus on that in a little bit. Um, but really, it's made up of the underlying fabric. The fabric is your management for your individual compute, storage, and networking resources. So if we look at the servers that we have, we have multiple different servers that we're managing. Some of them are managed because they're hosts that are hosting virtual machines, like this primary server up here. But other ones are just infrastructure servers that we use for things like the library, or we use for storage and networking um, resources. Uh, so you have all the different hosts that you're connected to inside of there, and they're stored in different things like my different host groups. Now, when you go on to networking and compute storage and networking management, um, the networking is where we're going to focus on things like our different logical network environments. Now, these logical network environments help me to support a multi-tenant environment, which allows me, as we'll talk about later on in the talk today, to really branch out and, and support multiple different tenants and resources within our environment. Um, and then lastly, we have the storage management. And what storage management allows me to do is create classifications and pools of existing storage for allocation to the underlying physical host. So now I can take LUNs that are created and I can manually create them here inside of Virtual Machine Manager, attach them to my physical host, and then use them for virtual machines. So the fabric management is what we're really going to focus on in this first video. And then the other videos are going to focus on these other pieces, like the VMs and services. And we've got the fabric. We have the library. And the library is where we store our different template configurations for both virtual machine templates as well as these services that, we, that I've talked about. And then lastly, we have jobs and settings, which we use to create things like user roles and such like that. So this was a quick tour of Virtual Machine Manager. Now I'm going to switch back to the presentation, and we'll focus on the different topics that we're talking about today, which is the compute, storage, and network management. All right, so let me pop back into the presentation here. And we'll now focus on the deploying the compute, the storage, and network resources. All right, so if we talk about deploying compute storage and networking, the first thing we're going to talk about is working on the underlying compute fabric. So when we talk about the compute fabric here, what we're really focusing on is the underlying hypervisor. And with Virtual Machine Manager, with System Center 2012, we introduced this capability to deploy Hyper-V directly onto bare metal servers from Virtual Machine Manager itself. So now Virtual Machine Manager can be that tool that allows me to connect to a physical server that has nothing deployed to it. You've just plugged in, say, the out-of-band management card, 
and we can deploy an OS on it, boot it up, set up Hyper-V on that system, and get it up and, de and deployed and running. Well, with 2012 SP1 and 2012 R2, we've made some improvements on what types of things you can do within that server and how you can configure it for things like setting up your network teaming, connecting to your, hyper your fiber channel SANs, or anything like that. And with SP1, we introduced this thing called Deep Discovery. Now, Deep Discovery will go out and it'll query the machine. It'll learn about what physical devices are connected to the machine so that you can make an intelligent choice as to which network adapters maybe are teamed together, which ones are set up for networking, which ones are set up for virtual machines, and that type of thing. So we now can deploy a brand new server by doing a deep discovery and use our approved configurations for deploying that server. In other words, I will take a profile of a host and I will use that profile to deploy across all these different servers that I have out there. And that allows me to do things like say, maybe I have 100 blade servers and I want to deploy Hyper-V on all those different systems. I can create this configuration for those systems because I know it's going to be these exact same NICs are connected to this, these things are um, teamed up over here, maybe these are used for management. And I can just then boot up the system, configure it, and deploy it. So let's see how that actually works. If we go to this next slide here, what we're really focusing on is I have this bare metal server. I've plugged it into my network. Um, I hooked up the out-of-band management. You know, if it's HP, the ILO card, it's Dell DRAC, or whatever system I have for that out-of-band management. And I turn it on. So VMM server goes and it talks to the out-of-band management server and it tells that server to reboot. When the server boots up, it does an F12, basically it does a pixie boot, talks to the WDS server. The WDS server then authorizes that server against VMM. VMM says, yes, that's the right server, boot it up. Well, WDS server throws down a WinP image onto that system. The system boots up and then runs a couple of set of calls to collect the hardware inventory of that system. Now all that hardware inventory is gathered and it's then passed back to Virtual Machine Manager so that you as an administrator can decide which NICs you want to connect to say the management network, which ones you want to connect to VM networks, which ones you want to team together, those types of things. And once you've done that deep discovery and you've decided which ones get assigned to what, you then go through the rest of the provisioning process. So at that point then, it again takes the machine, does another reboot of the machine using the out-of-band management controller. At that point, it boots up again, does a pixie boot, talks to the WDS server, which authorizes against VMM. VMM then throws down the Windows PE image. At that point now, we start doing some of the customizations. Any scripts for, for as far as configuring partitions, doing any type of pre-OS deployment configuration that we have to do. Once all that's done and we have the, part the uh, let's say the C drive created and partitioned and formatted out there, we will then copy down a VHD file. And that VHD file will then be the system that we will boot from when we boot up this machine to be running Hyper-V. So it'll copy the VHD down, it will copy down all the drivers necessary. So if this is a, say, an HP or a Dell system and it needs a custom SCSI array driver or it needs a fiber channel adapter or driver for the fiber channel connection or something like that, we can copy all those drivers down to the machine. After we finish copying all those things down to the machine, we'll then customize the machine, give it the machine name that we wanted to have this machine on the network on it. It'll do a domain join to the domain, in this case, the Contoso domain. After that, every time a domain joins, it has to do a reboot. So we'll enable Hyper-V, we'll do a reboot. And then at that time, after it's rebooted, it will now be a part of the domain, have Hyper-V role enabled. It'll be part of our host group. And then at that point, we can then create a cluster or whatever we want to do with it. In this case, um, the last thing is if you have any post-install scripts that you want it to run, you'll be able to run those. Afterwards, you'll be able to then manage this thing as a fully managed host within VMM. So this now gives you a single point of being able to 
take a physical system, deploy an OS on it in a configuration that you have approved using the correct um, mappings of the adapters to the proper networks and those types of things and putting it all together so that from one centralized location you can have this machine go from zero to a fully functioning Hyper-V host managed within VMM. Now the thing about VMM is that we decided it's not just Hyper-V that we're going to manage, but we're also going to manage the other hypervisors that are out there. So we support VMware vSphere and with System Center 2012 SP1, we supported vSphere 4.1 and 5.1. Well, with R2, we've added vSphere 5.0 support. So now we support all the latest versions of VMware. We've also updated um, to support Citrix Send Server 6.1. Now, one of the caveats with VMware vSphere, as you'll see in this next slide, is that we manage vSphere through vCenter. So in other words, I manage my Hyper-V host directly, I manage my Citrix Zen server host directly, but to manage my VMware vSphere environment, the ESX servers, I have to manage them through um, vCenter. But the nice thing about the way we support these multiple different hypervisors is that we, once we are managing them under VMM, we treat them very similarly as far as how we deploy virtual machines and services to these different hypervisors. So one of the cool things that we've done with System Center 2012 is the ability to take these different hypervisors that are out there that we're managing and add them into either their own host group or combine them into the same host group. Because there are times when I may have, even though I have different hypervisors, I may have a common need on how I want to manage them. Maybe I want dynamic optimization to work a specific way across all these different hypervisors. And because of that, I'm going to include them in the same host group. Some people do put them in separate host groups, other people combine them. It's your choice and works well both ways. But the nice thing is, is by treating these different hypervisors as just hypervisors, I can do things like deploy a service, and depending on how I've created that service template, I can deploy that same common service to, say, my Hyper-V systems, my Citrix Zen server systems, or even my VMware systems, or across systems. Because everybody knows that most services or applications are not just one virtual machine, but they're usually multiple tiers, and each tier may have multiple different virtual machines inside of that tier. Low balance web server, clustered file server, something like that. And so I may want different tiers on different hypervisors, and I can set up VMM to allow me to provision an environment that supports that as well. So in this past few minutes, we've talked about managing um, your compute resources. Now we're going to start focusing on the storage resources. So here, this was a new thing that was introduced in System Center 2012 um, with VMM 2012, but it's really been improved over time with SP1 and now with R2 in that we're allowing you to use and manage your storage more effectively. You don't need to go back to the storage people every time now that you need a new LUN assigned to you. Wouldn't it be much nicer and easier to say, hey, can you give me a pool of, of disks? Give me, you know, give me three terabytes and let me divvy it out and allocate it to the different pieces of storage for my hypervisors as I see fit. And so what we've done with VMM is allow you to leverage the fact that we can provide this end-to-end -end association between my underlying physical host resources and the storage that these virtual machines are residing upon. So now I know from the host side that it's talking to say in a fiber channel SAN environment through this HBA to that fiber channel SAN to that LUN that's assigned on it to that VHD file or I can go the other way. From the SAN environment I can look at the VHD and see oh it's connected through the fiber channel to this particular host and the masking or the unmasking of the host between that physical host and the LUN that it's talking to on the SAN allows me to really get a good view and know exactly which servers are talking to which LUNs and need to be able to access which um, shares, whether it's via LUN for fiber channel or iSCSI or file share or any of that. 
also gives me the ability to see how my capacity is running right now and provide some capacity management. Um, when I create these CSVs on these lines, if I'm doing things like thin provisioning, to know that I'm starting to run out of disk space or something like that, and to understand how I can add new storage capacity or remove storage capacity as I see fit, as I need it, not waiting on somebody else or some other team to be able to give that to me. And then helps me in things like rapid provisioning. Um, so if I have the ability to support um, ODX or offload data transfer via the SAN, let's take advantage of it. And with R2, we've really improved the capabilities on what types of things we can take advantage of with ODX inside of VMM. So VMM provides that end-to-end -end mapping where it goes from a unified storage management API. So we are leveraging the SMIS protocol to manage my environment. But whether the devices support SMIS, SMP, or is a spaces environment from Windows Server 2012 R2, we can support them and do the same common tasks across all of these different types of storage the same way from within VMM. And VMM will handle that for me. So a new support within R2 is the ability to support spaces storage devices. And we support it in a couple of different ways, and we'll talk about those over the next few slides. One of them is the ability to understand a file share and create a file share as a classified piece of storage, just like a iSCSI or a fiber channel SAN type storage environment. Um, other things that we do is that we support um, discovery of the Hyper-V hosts and the different HBAs and the different devices that are connected to them so that um, when we deploy a virtual machine or we, we create and configure a physical host and we want to connect to a piece of storage, we can do that. Um, we can unmask the LUN so that the storage is accessible via, by that Hyper-V host and they can talk to each other and we can talk to the different pieces that allow us to support that. Um, storage monitoring. So we support the things like indications and inventing from the SMIS protocol, meaning that if I did something like created a LUN outside of VMM and assigned it to a pool that VMM has access to, VMM will be able to notice that that LUN was created and be able to take advantage of it. So I can manage the storage pool through VMM and you know, for most parts I would want to do it that way. But if it does get created outside of VMM, I can still leverage it uh, for within Virtual Machine Manager. We also have the ability for um, being able to discover SAN and storage devices. So we can talk to the SMIS providers for your different storage partners, and then those devices uh, will be able to, to will be able to query them and find out what storage is attached to them that we have access to, that we can deploy LUNs and those types of things for. So we do that for your SAN devices. Um, we do it for your, um, your iSCSI devices. We also do it for your file servers, like your Windows um, scale-out file server, which is new with R2. And not only do we do the discovery of that, but we can also do things like do deployment of a scale-out file server and then manage the storage spaces behind that. Um, so over time, between 2012, SP1, and now R2, we've really increased and expanded our SMIS support. So not only the different types of SMIS providers and such that we support um, has just increased depending on the different um, SAN or, or um, iSCSI type vendors that you have, but we've also added new devices and stuff. So um, one of the things we've done besides managing these different storage providers is we've added lifecycle indications. And lifecycle indications allow us to understand what's happening in the storage environment so that we don't accidentally delete a LUN that we're not supposed to. We're not going to delete a LUN that we never created, those types of things. We're also going to see changes that happen and we'll be able to inform our, the clients that we're managing of those changes so that if a new LUN was exposed, we can then mask that LUN to, or unmask that LUN for a host, and then that host will be able to then use that as extra storage, say another CSV or something like that within the um, file share or the Hyper-V host or something like that. 
And then lastly, we've enhanced our iSCSI and um, our, our SAS connected storage devices, so our storage spaces and those types of things. And with 2012 SP1, we added support for the Microsoft iSCSI um, target. So now what that means is that if I am using the Microsoft iSCSI target as that backend storage, then I can deploy LUNs to it, I can create LUNs from it, I can attach those LUNs to the different Hyper-V hosts, and I can effectively manage that storage and all from an internal um, Microsoft solution at that point. So we've done storage, um, expanded that storage SMIS support, but we've also are able to better manage the capacity that's on the storage devices. So in other words, here, we know what devices that we're connected to, and we can build in automation to understand which servers and, and hosts that we're connected to at this point, and we can manage the underlying physical fabric that's, that's connected there. So what this means is that I can talk now not only to the storage devices, like the EMC SAN or the HP SAN or whatever, but I can also talk to the switches that are out there. And within those switches, I can do some zone management. I can add these Hyper-V hosts as members of a specific zone so that they can have access to the storage or things like that. Uh, we have iSCSI, Firebase General, and SAS capacity management where we can add capacity or remove capacity from what we're managing. So in other words, I have a piece of storage that's available to me. I can allocate pieces of that as different lines and I can assign them to specific hosts and then I can pull those away if I want to. With Windows Server 2012 R2, we've added support, better support for file servers. So file servers are now a storage managed entity and I can create new file shares, I can connect to file shares, we'll handle all the ACLs, the um, access control to those file shares from the host. So that means like a hyper, I, have, I create a new file share on a file server and I want to add a Hyper-V host to that file share. When I add that file share to the Hyper-V host, it'll set up the permissions so that that Hyper-V host will be able to store virtual machines up on that file share. We've also made support in managing the new VHDX um, file format. Not that we didn't support that, we supported that with SP1, but with R2, what we've done is we've um, allow you now to support some of the new capabilities that VHDX supports, like shared VHDX. So we'll take advantage of shared VHDX from within inside of VMM. We'll allow you to use VHDX and shared VHDXs as part of the backend storage for a tier within a service template and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on in these videos. So now I have the storage all set up and managed, I need to, I'm going to walk you through how our storage allocation process works. So Virtual Machine Manager will look at, through our SMS providers, it will connect to the different storage that's out there. And this storage could be um, multiple different types of storage. You know, I could have an iSCSI environment, I could have a file share, I could have a fiber channel environment. Through the different SMIS providers, I'll be able to access and see all of these different pieces of storage. Once I've done that, I'll be able to create these classifications and pools. And so I could create different tiers of storage. Maybe I have some really expensive, fast storage that I want to call my tier one storage. And that tier one storage could be in my primary data center. Well, maybe I have a secondary data center and I want to deploy the same type of service, but the tier one storage over there isn't as fast. That's okay, I can create this classification called a tier one storage, put these different storage pieces into that same classification. So when I deploy a virtual machine in my production data center, it goes to the tier one storage there, which is the high IOPS storage. But when it goes to the development data center or the other data center, and it needs to be deployed to a tier one piece of storage, it gets deployed to the right storage, though it just may not be as fast as the other tier one storage. And I can have two different devices have different classifications depending on the types of disk. Maybe I have fast disk in one storage pool and I'm gonna put that in my tier one environment. Maybe I have slower disks in another pool and I'm gonna put that as my tier two environment. So I can really break up the storage 
has IC fit as an administrator. Once I've created these classifications and have associated it with the different stores that I'm managing, I can allocate those different tiers to the different host groups that I have out there. By allocating them to the host groups, then the hosts within there that have access to that storage, I can start allocating storage directly to those Hyper-V hosts. So if I had an existing LUN out there, I could take that LUN and I can assign it to that Hyper-V host or that cluster of Hyper-V hosts. Or I can use, through the SMIS protocol, I can use the ability to create a new LUN or create a new storage space. Um, and that would be talking um, directly to the space. And once I've created that space, I can then assign it to a particular set of nodes or clusters and have the virtual machines um, be able to be deployed upon that piece of storage. And I can do this from the different tiers and classifications of storage that I have out there. So one of the new things that we added within Windows Server 2012 R2 is um, better support for storage spaces and creating these scale-out file servers. And with VMM 2012 R2, we've increased uh, the capabilities of it, and not only do we deploy bare metal Hyper-V systems, but we can now also deploy from bare metal a scale-out file server. So what this means is that I can take a physical set of servers, backed up with a JBOD, and I can create a scale-out file server from there, from bare metal, all using Virtual Machine Manager. I can either do it from bare metal, or if I have an existing set of servers out there that are already connected to a JBOT, I can just bring those under management. Um, so I can create storage pool from bare metal. I can create spaces on top of that pool. I can attach them to the file servers and create a cluster and take that scale out file server cluster. All of this from bare metal all the way up to the fact that I have these scale file servers created and these scale file servers are clustered together and they've created a shares, and those shares are now allocated to the Hyper-V hosts that are available. So I do a bare metal deploy of the OS, create the scale of file server cluster, create the storage pools, create the file share within those storage pools, and assign that file share to the Hyper-V hosts, all within VMM. And that allows me now to bring it all together, and I can have my Hyper-V host managed and bare metal deployed there. I can have the file servers, bare metal deployed and created, that the Hyper-V are going to be storing their virtual machines upon, and do that all from within Virtual Machine Manager. So now let's flip over to a demo, and let me show you a little bit about the storage that we have configured uh, within this environment, so that you can see what's going on uh, within the system. That existing environment that we were looking at earlier, and under the Fabric tab, we have the storage piece of it in the Fabric workspace. Now, inside the storage, we have the different classifications and pools. And like you can see here, I have two different classifications. I have an infrastructure classification, which doesn't have any storage attached to it. And I have this tier one classification, which has a file server attached to it. And that file server has 24 gigs of storage assigned to that pool. And inside that pool, um, basically four gigs or about four gigs have been used. And the rest of it is available as capacity. I'm sorry, not 24 gigs, but 24 terabytes of space assigned to it. Now, where does FS01 come from? This file server here comes from the different file servers, um, providers that we have that are available to us. And we can see here that I have a scale-out file server that I've created. And this scale-out file server has disk space assigned to it. And that disk space is what I'm using um, for the different pieces of storage. And if I right-click on that scale-out file server and we click on Manage Pools, you can see that that's where FS01 comes from. It has six disks attached to it. So this is the scale-out file server. I've created a space with six disks. And um, everything seems to be running OK with that piece of it right now. Well, the fact is, is that file server is a clustered storage space, which has 24 terabytes of capacity. And I'm only using four of that because I've mirrored those two terabyte LUNs that I have are in a mirrored environment. So you know I'm not going to lose uh, the data in that respect. 
If I look at the properties of that storage space, we can see that I have um, configuration of that where I have different pools inside of here and I have classifications. One thing I may want to do is maybe I've added more hard disks to that pool of storage or to that JBOD that these machines, uh, that this storage is, is accessing. And I want to be able to take advantage of that new set of disks. So I need to add more resources so that I can then create a file share on top of that. And how I do that is I basically need to go through and just do the configuration from within Virtual Machine Manager, which I'll show you here. All right, so I want to add resources. And I already have added the storage devices. And that's where I can add my file server. Like if I wanted to create, an, if I wanted to add a new file server that was out there or a SAN or fiber channel device. But what we're going to want to do now is really take that storage space that we've added previously and we're going to want to create a new space um, for those additional disks that we've added. And so inside of there I'll go to the file server section and if I right click on that scale out file server and I choose manage pools, what we'll see inside of here is that I can create a new pool. And this new pool has the different disks that I haven't already allocated to any particular storage space environment. And I'll just take the next two disks in the list here and I'll hit create. And before I hit create, I'll have to give it a name. So we'll call this one FS11 instead of file server 01. And we'll hit create. And let's give it a classification. Again, I'm going to put this one in infrastructure instead of tier one because I can assign different classifications for the different storage environments. And as you can see here, I have FS01, which has six data disks, and I have this new one called FS11, which has two data disks. Hit OK there. And now we have a pool available for us. And if we create a new file server inside of there, or what we can call a logical unit, we can choose that FS11 pool and because it had two disks assigned to it, it has eight terabytes of space available for it. We're going to give this file share right here. We're going to call it VM data 11. And we're going to give it four terabytes of SIT base. Now I can create a thin storage logical unit or a fixed size logical unit. And because I don't want to run out of disk space and be cut by thin provisioning or anything like that. I'm just going to create a fixed size storage logical unit for this environment. Hit OK, and it's going to take up four terabytes of space on that storage pool. And now we can see that there is a new file server share that's going to be available to me. And if I go under my classifications and pools, we can now see that not only do I have FS01 with the three different logical units there, but I have my FS11 here, and it's creating the pool. If we bring up the jobs window, we can see whether it was successful or failed. We were successful in creating the new pool, but we had a problem creating the actual share because um, of a... Uh, the code here. So we'll just, we can go through that and fix it if we need to um, add that new pool and create a new LUN. Um, we can go through the steps again, but basically at that point, we now have a pool that we've managed and we can, after we fix whatever challenges we had there, we can create a LUN that we can then assign, or file share that we can then assign to the different uh, physical servers that are out there. So that is where you would manage your storage environment. And whether I have both file servers or I have different arrays, um, like, or I create a different provider where these two providers are for storage spaces or Windows file servers, but I could add one for my fiber channel SANs that are out there, add another one for my iSCSI SANs, and those would be all available then as managed store devices that I can use for um, allocating storage to my different individual Hyper-V servers. 
All right, now we're going to flip back to the presentation. We're going to talk about networking. All right, so here we've really focused on the compute and the storage environment. And now what we're going to focus on is what kinds of things can we do with Windows Server 2012 R2 and System Center 2012 R2 to support the new networking aspects that um, Windows Server has added uh, with Windows Server 2012 and then Windows Server 2012 R2. So within networking, uh, with Windows, with uh, System Center 2012 and VMM 2012, uh, we had this physical sets of resources that we pulled together and, and allocated to our different environments, and we created these things called logical networks. We've added more separation or segregation between how the underlying physical host looks at the network and how the virtual machines look at the network in this thing called a VM network. And that was designed to support these multi-tenant environments. So I have this logically grouped set of resources, and I have underneath these networking pieces um, that are the logical networks that the physical servers look at. But then I also have created now these VM networks that I store up in the different cloud environments that I have that I use for the multi-tenant isolation or the separation of the different virtualized environments. And so you're going to see, you saw a new capability or a new separate segregation inside of 2012 SP1 of this thing called logical networks and VM networks. Well, with R2, we've really made that separation because we need that isolation for supporting things like Hyper-V network virtualization. So if we look at Hyper-V network virtualization, which came about in 2012, but it was really been enhanced in, in Windows Server 2012 R2. Um, what does this exactly mean, and how does VMM and System Center take advantage of it? Well, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about what Hyper-V network virtualization is. And it starts off with a tenant environment. So I have this group or this company or whatever, and we'll call it the blue company. And they have, say, a SQL server and a web server. And those SQL server and web server have particular IP address schema. And in this case, it's 10.1.1 for the SQL server and 10.1.1.2 for the web server. Well, that physical environment and what's underlying the physical, I mean, that virtual environment is what the virtual machines see. But the physical environment, maybe it's on a 192.168 network. So even though I have this virtual machine running on Hyper-V that's a SQL server running on Hyper-V 1 and a web server running on Hyper-V 2, they need to talk to each other via this 10.1.1.x network. Um, I may have this provider address space in my data center that in Think of this as the logical network that is 192.168. And so I need to have the separation and be able to route the packets in that 10.1.1 network without it affecting um, with it running on the physical wire that's a 192.168 network. And so we create these provider addresses, like in this example, .1.10 and .2.12. So these are on two totally different subnets, these type of hosts. But the provider address allows me to support that. Um, and we can route the packets between them. And so we know that 10.1.1.1 is on the host that's .10, and .2 is on the host that's .12. And they can talk to each other. And everything's good, because we have network virtualization. We're using NVGRE, or Network Virtualization Generic Routing Encapsulation. And we're taking those packets. We're encapsulating them, passing them around the physical wire, and then de-encapsulating de them and passing them up to the virtual machine. Everything's working good, everything's working great. But what happens if we add another environment in there? We might have a little challenge in that I'm now adding a totally separate networked environment. So we have blue here, we're going to add this new company, this orange company. And this orange group, they have the exact same 
networking schema. In other words, they have a SQL service running on 10.1.1.1 and a web service running on 10.1.1.2. And I want to ensure that both the blue network only sees the blue network servers and the orange network only sees the orange network servers. But I got to make sure that they're all running on the same physical set of hosts. So we're commingling those hosts. And we do that through NVGRE, through our, um, that, it, disassociates and separates the two different networks and virtualization um, is happening so the virtual machines are able to talk to each other but they're not going to um, they're not going to see the other networks traffic so we've keeping the networks isolated from within each other and we're allowing different tenants to use these different networks and the same physical network. And so that's where you can see the stuff up top, that 10.1.1.x networks for the blue network would be one VM network, for the orange network would be another VM network. The underlying physical addresses, the 192.168.10 or .11 or .12 or .13 or whatever is the logical network. And that's how VMM makes that association between the networks above and the logical networks below. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. Um, so this allows me to provide isolation between the different environments. And you can provide isolation in many different ways. I can provide isolation by having physical separation. In other words, I have these two blue and this orange network on two totally separate uh, networks. Um, this blue network only uses these adapters or these particular Hyper-V hosts. This orange network only uses these blue, uh, physical adapters or these Hyper-V hosts. And so they're physically separated from each other. But that doesn't give me the best utilization of all my resources. I can use VLANs, and VLANs allows me to create, well, this 10.1.1 network over here can use VLAN 26. This 10.1.1 network over here can use VLAN 47. And since they're totally different VLANs, the network traffic is totally isolated from one another that way. But that becomes hard to manage when I have many different servers, many different companies, and I want to have all these different VLAN environments and I have to know which VLANs are for which networks are attached to which hosts and set up the routing between all these different hosts. So it can be a challenging thing for our, our customers to support. I can create PVLAN, which gives me the secondary tag that helps me even isolate this even further. But it still becomes a, a headache when I start expanding this out to many, many, many different hosts and many, many, many different guests. So by using network virtualization, I'm able to more simply create this isolation and have that isolation fit through across all these different servers that are out there. And that isolation can cross subnets and those types of things as well. And I can create this split between the two. So if we do look at VLANs, um, we can have a benefit um, we can have this separation between the physical environment and the network virtualized environment by creating a virtual LAN. But I'm maxed out for any one switch or port at 4,000 or so VLANs that are out there. And I have to ensure that I have the right VLANs created and set up on each of the different ports that the different Hyper-V hosts and networks are going to be connected to. If I move over to private VLANs or PVLANs, as we talked about, I can create that isolation, I can create some of that separation, and by having a secondary tag with this PVLANs, I can even split out things um, so that the virtual machines can even, within that same virtual machine, be isolated as far as traffic from one another, and those types of things. And VMM 2012 SP1 allows you to support the creation and in, instead of isolated VLANs with PVLANs. So you could use that as your isolation mechanism within um, Virtual Machine Manager, depending on if you wanted them isolated or you wanted a community where they could all talk to each other and those types of things. Um, but network virtualization gives you a better advantage as far as combining these things together. So getting rid of um, PVLANs and VLANs and using just straight network virtualization. If I wanted to use no isolation between those, then all these virtual machines are sharing the same network and um, 
the virtual machines before SP1 of Virtual Machine Manager 2012 would just all be connected to the same logical network and they would all just have the same network address. I create a new VM network inside of there and I have all those virtual machines that are connected with no isolation there and what happens is that all these virtual machines are on the same network. So with no isolation, I'm just basically passing everything through to the physical adapter. It's on the network the same as everything else. I'm not using any type of network virtualization. That helps in that it makes things very simple but what it does do is make things confusing in that if I had a blue network and I had an orange network, they couldn't both be on the same network without being able to see the traffic between each other because they had direct access to the infrastructure. This would be something I would use if I only had one type of organization that was using these virtual machines and I didn't have a need for that isolation. So if you look at it, um, if I'm looking at my environment and I see that I'm just managing infrastructure VMs where I don't have these multiple different tenants, then maybe VLANs or no isolation is fine. That's all that I need because I don't need to add the complexity of adding uh, network virtualization when everything's sharing the same IP range. And my virtual machines basically can share the same IP range as the physical hosts that are out there or other physical hosts on the network. If I have a service type environment and I have a load balancer on there, or maybe I have an internet facing environment, and I want to add that extra layer of protection, that extra isolation between the different systems. So even if I have multiple systems sharing the same LAN, um, VLAN, but I want them to be separated as far as they can't talk to each other without going through a router or something like that, then PVLAN would be the solution there. If I have multiple tenants, especially when I start getting to many of these tenants and I have multiple needs for isolation across many different hosts, network virtualization will decrease the complexity in that it'll simplify my management and I'll be able to pass these, P these uh, network virtualized environments across all of these different Hyper-V hosts that are out there. So for a hoster or for a enterprise company or any company that wants to basically treat their customers as tenants, then network virtualization would be the solution there. And there, you just need to worry about you know, what network environment I have, whether it's IPv4, IPv6, and those types of things, and what they need to connect to out in the physical world. So that talks about things like that brings up considerations like address spaces and what matters or is needed there. Well, if I was building a networked environment and I had, say, you know, as an organization, I get a few IP addresses or I get a set of IP addresses. I have my internet facing IP addresses and those are ones that I get from the outside world. Then I also have my internal network adapters. And what a lot of organizations will do is they'll create a few infrastructure spaces that they'll use for that underlying logical network environment. And maybe they'll have a, a network for management, they'll have a network for their network virtualization provider addresses to be sitting upon, they'll have a network for their backend clustering, storage, network, iSCSI, whatever. Um, and those will be managed independently of each of the isolated tenant networks. And an example here is, you know, I could use my 10 dot ranges for my management, my infrastructure machines, and I could use the 192 range for my tenants. Um, it really all depends on how many virtual machines you're going to be running for those, within those tenants, whether you want to use a 192.168 address, or you want to use a 172.16, or you want to use a 10 dot network for that. But what we're really talking about here is that my managed network environment for the management, you know, talking to VMM, VMM talking to the Hyper-V host, those types of things, doesn't have to be on the same network that I'm using as my infrastructure for network virtualization, those provider set of addresses, which doesn't have to be the same network environment that I'm using for my backend storage, my live migration, those types of things. I can create separate networked environments, and it might be easier that way because then I don't have to worry about my 
VMM talking on the same network and the tra same traffic that my infrastructure stuff is talking. I can keep them there or I can separate them out. Uh, with VMM, they can be static or DHCP addresses, doesn't matter, we'll help you connect with them. Now with 2012 SP1, we introduced this thing called a VM network. And we also talk about this thing called the logical switch. And think about it this way. The VM network defines connectivity. So it basically defines if I'm inside that virtual machine and I'm talking out to the physical world, I'm going to see the network as exposed to me by that VM network. With the logical switch assigns, so that basically assigns connectivity. Um, what a logical switch does for me is it assigns me what capabilities I have when I'm talking out to the physical world. In other words, maybe I want to set up network quality of service. I want to set up a bandwidth maximum or a guaranteed minimum or something like that inside of the network. Well, I would assign that at the logical switch uh, through a port profile, and then I would attach that to a particular virtual machine. Um, so logical switches define capability. What kind of a quality of service I'm going to set, what kind of optimizations, what kind of network extensions I'm going to attach. Those are all done through the logical switch, whereas VM networks show me what the network looks like from the VM's point of view. VM looking down sees a VM network that has a particular IP range and that's the thing that it sees. So when we look at the connectivity through VM networks, what we're really focusing on here is things like multi-tenancy. I can create multiple different VM networks for different groups. Um, and each of these VM networks has an owner, so someone who's created that VM network. Um, I can then allow either the tenant admin to create that VM network, or I can give it creation by um, the administrator of the environment as well. But what a VM network allows me to do, by being able to create a VM network, I can focus on the ability to, um, to, as a tenant of an organization, say, okay, this is what my IP range is going to be, this is the VM network I want to create, so when I deploy virtual machines, they have the right IP schema, and then if I need to get out to the physical world, it goes through the gateway and attaches to the right thing. This allows a organization to basically bring their own IP schema to either a service provider or let's say a business unit has, you know, like sales in, in a company has a particular IP range or maybe they're, you know, through acquisition, I have another company, I've acquired them, they have their own IP configuration over there. Well, I want to bring their infrastructure and combine it with mine, but I don't want to have to change all their different old IP addresses. I can bring that network into my network environment um, through the use of VM networks. So this allows me leveraging things like network virtualization to create my own little multi-tenant environment that's isolated from each other and um, use that to be able to have the virtual machines talk out and get the IPs as if they were accessing the real world, whether they're using things like network virtualization or VLANs or whatever underneath. The logical switch here defines things like the security. If I, within Hyper-V 2012, I can support things like DHCP guard or router guard, I can turn those things on at the logical switch level, and any logical switch that's created from this basically logical switch template, I've, any Hyper-V virtual switch on a Hyper-V system that's created from this logical switch definition will have those things turned on for it. I can set up quality of service, so I can set up things like throughput, um, or relative weight of this virtual machine environment for um, as opposed to other virtual machines through the use of port profiles. And if I need to turn on things like um, no, offloading um, access to the machines or I want to set up teamed environments or those types of things, I do that through the logical switch template. Um, so one of the things that we also do support inside of VMM is this single root IO virtualization or SRIOV. 
And what this allows me to do is it allows me to bypass the virtual switch for high performance workloads. So what this means is that I can um, just, if I know that I'm going to be using a lot of traffic, I can basically like dedicate this network adapter to um, this virtual switch and um, basically we'll just offload a bunch of stuff directly onto the network adapter and get the best throughput we can get for it. But we're, it's going to limit the amount of VMs that can support it. So I would only do this for a specific set of adapters and only for a specific set of VMs that are, are using that. And I lose all the other capabilities because we're bypassing the virtual switch. So I'm going to lose all of those things. But if I know I need it for a particular set of virtual machines, I can turn it on and enable it. So we've talked about this logical switch definition, and we really want to understand what that means. Well, think of it this way. Maybe I have a couple of data centers. Um, maybe it's a couple of floors in two different buildings or something like that. So in this example, I've created a logical switch for my building 44. And that logical switch has a definition as to um, configuration of that Hyper-V virtual switch I'm going to create and any extensions that I might want to add, like the Cisco Nexus 1000V or whatever other um, extensions that are out there that I may want to create, like, like the one from 5.9 or whatever that's out there. But it also has information about the virtual machines that are going to be running on there. So I'm going to also be able to create these port profiles for the different virtualized environments. Um, so maybe I have a specific pro pro port profile for my database environments. I want to give them a network bandwidth quality of service of a guaranteed minimum of 30 megabits a second, no matter what, that type of thing. So I can create those types of environments inside of there. I may have a web environment where I want to cap the limit so it doesn't take over my network at like 100 megabits per second or something like that. I can do those types of things. I also create a pro port profile for the uplink. Do I want to team adapters? And if I want to team adapters, what does it look like? Do I want to use offloading? Those types of things. So I create these port profile sets. And I create a classification for each of the port profiles. So now when I create a service template, I assign a classification to that service template. And that allows me then to have the ability to um, deploy this service template across multiple different data centers where the different physical devices might have different capabilities. So in building 44, I got these really brand new servers that have all these whiz bang um, new features and everything inside of them. Well, my classifications here um, support these different profile sets which have these different limitations. Maybe these are all 10 gig adapters and so I can really bump up the guaranteed minimums or, or crank up that maximum. But in my old development environment, I have the same need for that service to be deployed, but maybe they're older servers and they don't have as much capability. Well, here I might, for that same classification, I might attach a different port profile to that logical switch so that I don't, like in the production, I was able to get you know 10 gigabits of traffic, where in this dev environment, I only get one gigabit of traffic. So I need to limit that maximum to 100 meg instead of two gigs of traffic or something like that. So I can build those types of things. And maybe here, instead of using a teamed environment, I don't team it or something like that. So that's how I assign and create these logical switch definitions. And it gives me the flexibility to create multiple different common logical switches with just different types of connections to the classification. So when I create those virtual machines, they're going to use the right profile depending on the physical servers that they're running on. So how does this all work? Well, I have these different Hyper-V hosts, and those have physical adapters, one or more, that are attached to a physical switch. I've created a logical switch definition that has specific port profiles, has specific settings, um, has uplink port profiles, and all this configuration assigned to it. Well, what's going to happen is, is that on this Hyper-V host, let's say Hyper-V host 1, I'm going to go into the configuration of that Hyper-V host, and I'm going to look at the adapters that are there, and I'm going to say, create a new virtual switch. I'm going to take that logical switch definition, and I'm going to choose the adapter 
inside of that virtual switch that I want to manage. And I'm going to say which logical switch do I want to add to it. And so I'm going to say that this port profile that I'm going to use for the uplink piece is this is going to be a management port profile um, that it's going to use to be on the uplink. Um, these virtual port profiles are available to it, so when I create new virtual machines, they can get those virtual port profiles assigned to them depending on which template I use and which virtual machines are going to be attached to it. And I can have the, either the same logical switch definition or a different one for the other host. But this allows me to, with the logical switch definition, when it gets applied to a host, define what I'm going to do with the physical adapters that I'm attaching to this logical switch and what are the characteristics that the virtual machines that are being deployed against that logical switch have access to. And what happens is, is if things change, if someone makes a change or something on that switch, those things can become out of compliance. And if they do become out of compliance, or maybe I've made a change to my logical switch settings themselves, which means now the host is out of compliance, I can then remediate that, apply those, those changes to the host. Uh, so here we went from a one type of port profile for a VM to a different type of port profile for a VM. And once I've remediated that, then you know, everything's back and running fine. So it allows me to manage these switches more appropriately. With 2012 R2, we added uh, inside of Virtual Machine Manager this new network service support. So now instead of having all these different separate providers, we have this one thing called a network service. And when you create a network service, you can decide, is it a thing like a load balancer? Is it a switch extension? Is it a network virtualization gateway? And configure it all up. So now instead of having to go to all these different locations to configure your different um, types of network services, you can do that all from within um, the network service section of the uh, of, of VMM. Um, so this makes life a little easier as you're managing all these different extensions that are out there. If I have an extension, say like the Cisco Nexus 1000V or the Inmon S Flow monitoring adapter, or a third-party virtualization gateway like um, from Iron Networks or F5 or Arista, or you're using, say, our um, Microsoft Windows Server 2012 R2 provided inbox NVGRE gateway. You can manage them from within the same tab, basically, within VMM. And we have a lot of partners that are supporting um, VMM and the things like the Hyper-V switch extensions, the um, inbox or the gateway adapters and those types of things. And so we're working with a lot and load balancers and such. So we're working with a lot of these partners to allow you to extend your environment. And if you attach one of these switch extensions to a logical switch definition, when you apply that to these 10 Hyper-V hosts, it'll apply it to all those hosts, copy the right files down and get it all configured and set up and ready to go for you. Uh, the other thing we provided with Windows Server 2012 R2 is this new inbox gateway. So now Windows Server 2012 R2 can be the gateway for taking those network virtualized packets and moving them out to the physical world. So what this means is that if I have two different tenants and those two different tenants are talking just VM to VM, everything's fine within their tenant environment. So like we had the web server and the SQL server, they could talk to each other in the orange network. The web server and the SQL server could talk to each other. And they couldn't talk to, from the orange network to the blue network or the blue network to the orange network. Well, what happens is that that blue network, they can talk to each other, but they can't talk out to the physical world. So to talk out to the physical world, I have to have a gateway. And that gateway can be one of the ones provided by our partners, a physical device, or it can be an inbox gateway that we support with Windows Server 2012 R2. And VMM now provides within Virtual Machine Manager the ability to take that, create that network virtualization gateway. And we do it in one of two ways. With um, the preview release, we came out with a template 
for a um, single server Hyper-V host that we can manage that can be that virtual gateway device. And it has a bunch of VMs installed on it, and those VMs become the gateway routing devices from the virtualized network to the physical network. Uh, when, with 2012R2, um, with the GA version, we're going to have not only it be the single host, but it could also be a highly available host, which means that now I can have a clustered environment and run this in my production environment to support getting those packets from the virtualized environment out to the physical world. And it gets it out to the physical world in one of a few ways. You can use NAT, uh, where it just puts it out on the network via network address translation. It could use a site-to-site -site VPN. So if I had a network at my blue environment in the physical world, and I create a site-to-site -site VPN with this gateway, then the blue VMs would be able to talk to it, and I'd be able to route packets back and forth, and they would be on the network just the same as anything else. Also supports border gateway protocol. This is key for multi-tenancy. So if we look at what that really means, it really means this, is that now I can bridge between the virtual machines running on my Hyper-V host, whether it's a service provider or it's running at a in my centralized data center to the different networks that are out there. So in this example here, my service provider under, underneath has all these different virtual machines. Some are with the orange or red network over here at Fabricam, some are with the blue network over at Contoso, and that Hyper-V network virtualization will set up the connection between those two environments and will allow you to create virtual machines that can then talk to the physical servers that are out there or the physical internet depending on how you have it set up and configure it. The gateway will do the encapsulation and the de-encapsulation of those MVGRP packets, and it will do the routing between this site and whatever site you want to access, whether it be via NAT, via site-to-site -site VPN, or BGP. But to do all this, you need to have, and we've created this thing called an address pool. And the address pools allow me to do things like create a set of IP addresses within a range, assign it to VMM, and then as I start deploying virtual machines, VMM will just take the next IP address available, give it to that VM, and get it up on the run in running. This is uh, good for organizations because now what I can do is I can get virtual machines that are up there with static IPs, but I don't have to physically assign each of those IPs to the different VMs when I do that. I can just basically have it go. Um, so we have the IP pools, the MAC pools, and um, also virtual IP pools for those things like uh, my load balancers and those service tiers. So the address pool is an important concept inside the VM network range so that I can ensure the VM networks have the ability to um, assign the right IP addresses to the different VMs on their tenants. Um, and then the last thing is, if I was setting up network virtualization, and I was setting up this network virtualization inside of just the virtual machines, this is before setting up all the gateway stuff to get it out to the real world, but I just wanted to set it up internally. The first thing I would do is I would create a provider network. So I create a logical network for the provider addresses for network virtualization to um, be created. And when I create this provider network, basically things that I have to remember are when I create the logical network, check that allow network virtualization is turned on. I want to add a network site within that provider subnet so that I can um, allocate IP addresses for the provider addresses that are going to be used. And I basically need one provider address per VM network per host that these virtual machines are going to be running upon. Um, and then create, I, so create IP pools within that network um, site for the provider addresses I'm going to use. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a native port profile for the uplink. Now this network port profile, I need to have ensure that Windows network virtualization filter is turned on. And I want to select the network site that the provider network that I've created for that provider network for this uplink port profile. After I do that, I create the logical switch definition. 
I add the uplink port profile. If I want to, inside that logical switch definition, create virtual port profiles, I can do that as well. I can do it now or I can do it later. Um, if I do it now, basically I can set things like quality of service, whether it's using DHCP guard, those types of things. Then next, I want to apply that logical switch definition to a host. So that logical switch definition, I go into the host properties and virtual switches, I add a new logical switch. I select the physical adapter or multiple adapters that I want to use for that switch if I'm going to team it. And I select the uplink port profile I'm going to use. And then the other thing is if this adapter is also the same adapter that I'm going to be using for management, I have to make sure that I add a new virtual adapter for that management network as well. And make sure that check host management is applied. And then once all that's done on the physical host, then I need to create the VM networks that the tenants are going to be used. And once I create those VM networks that the tenants are going to be used, then I can put those virtual machines on um, those IP pool ranges for those tenants. So that's how I configure it without doing the gateway. And then after that, I'll, you'll add the gateway, and that'll handle the routing out to the physical world for that piece of it. Now, within VMM, we support three different basic patterns for teamed adapters. So I can have non-converged adapters where I have different physical adapters that are out there and I have different adapters assigned to different virtual machines. I can combine these things together and have these multiple physical adapters team for each of these different types of networking environments. So I can have um, my storage networks teamed in one environment, my lab migration networks teamed in another one, clusters teamed, manage exactly, and, and team them all together. The next thing I could do is I could consolidate a lot of those by consolidating my management, my lab migration, cluster storage network, network environments onto a particular team, and I could even isolate my VMs off to a different team. Or, you know, technically there's no reason why I couldn't have all of these shared on one set of team or something like that. And then the last one is, is I can converge it with something like RDMA so I can get much, much better performance through these environments. Um, so these are different ways of teaming my adapters together. And VMM supports all these different team type approaches, and which basically means it's up to you. What do you want to do? How do you want to configure these things out there? And you can set up your teamed environments either way. Um, then the last thing we wanted to do is talk about um, how we handled network connectivity to, say, a different environment. Um, like, let's say I had a bunch of different companies and I want to connect to a, um, a hoster, or if I was an a IT environment and I wanted to kind of treat my environment as a hosted environment, I could have all these different networks out there and these different companies, and I would have to create a site-to-site -site gateway per tenant. So that would mean that if I had 100 tenants, I'd have 100 different site-to-site -site gateways. And that was just starting to get too extreme for our customers. And so with Windows Server 2012, we've really decreased how this thing works together, where I can now take the same multi-tenant environment but this gateway that we've created with Windows Server 2012 R2 um, can support multi-tenants routing through it. So now it means that I have a much more compressed and simple, com man simply managed environment for this multi-tenant environment. I can have people use NAT if I want to. I can create these different site-to-site -site tunnels, all of them going through the same network gateway device so that it gets out to and routed to the correct virtualization environment. Now, the one thing we did add when we added this gateway is that we made this thing the ability to have it be highly available. So it's going to be clustered for high availability. So now I can support all these different customers knowing that if I lost one of these gateway Hyper-V hosts, the other hosts would um, be up and running and continue to support that. We also support BGP for dynamic routing across the different environments so that if, you know, through the one network environment, it wants to access one piece of it, it can do that. But if it wants to access a different site, it can do that as well. 
Um, and then you can also create these multi-tenant access so that the virtual machine can just be out to the physical network the same way it would be like conceivably like you know at your, at your home with your cable modem router or something like that, that type of connection. So in this, before we end this video today, what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit about the network virtualization inside one last demo um, just to step through this really quickly. So now I'm going to pop over to the other demo here. And at this point, what we're going to do now, we've talked about storage. We've talked about networking. Now what we're going to do, I mean, and we talked about the compute management. Now what we're going to do is show you some of the things that um, the networking has, has, has set up for us um, and how these things work together. So if we go back to the environment here that we've been showing you earlier today, we had the storage and the compute that we've talked about. Now we're going to focus on the networking. And inside the networking, we talked about this thing called logical networks. So a logical network, especially one like this infrastructure network here, is um, this would be a logical network that I've created that's used basically for my management environment. Um, then I have these tenant provider IPs. And this tenant provider IPs was that second network that I created um, for the provider addresses for network virtualization. So I have them on their own unique subnet. And I've created a network site and a pool for them. And the first thing we were supposed to do is create a logical network with a network site for my provider addresses. So I created that right here. Then the next thing that we do is we um, create some port profiles. And the port profiles, I have two different types. We have both the virtual port, pro port profiles, which are for the VMs that are inside of there, and we have the management pro pro port profiles. And so I've created this provider uplink. And this is the port profile that defines the definition for um, my uplink. Uh, a couple of things here is if I wanted to set a particular load balancing algorithm, I can do that. Do I want this to be teamed? And if it is teamed, how it's teamed, I can set that. When I'm creating the port profiles, when I would turn on the network virtualization, enable Hyper-V network virtualization here, and which IPs am I going to use, uh, which network sites am I going to use? I'm using the tenant provider IPs inside of here. So I've created the network site called tenant provider IPs, and I check that to be assigned to this port profile. Um, once I've done both of those, I can create one of these guest uh, virtual uh, port profiles as well. And so here I have one here which has offload data settings. I can turn them on. Security settings, I want DHCV guard or router guard or anything like that set. And bandwidth, do I want to have, you know, a maximum bandwidth set, a minimum bandwidth set, and how important is this compared to other ones? Well, if this one's five and everything else is one, then it's going to get access to network more and faster than the other ones are going to get. So I can set all those things inside of the port profile for a virtual machine. Once I've done all that, then I look at the logical switches. And inside the logical switches, this is where I can create the switch definitions for the provider addresses and the external addresses and all those things. And so this is provider switch. Which extensions do I want to use? If I had other extensions, I could attach them in here. With Windows Server 2012 R2, we changed how we do extensions. So now things like your Nexus 1000V can also be um, attached to a logical switch or a virtual switch that's doing network virtualization. Um, which port profile do I use for the uplink? Do I want it teamed or not teamed? And here I say don't team it. And then for the port profiles, which ones do I want to allocate to this switch? This can have high bandwidth, low bandwidth, and medium bandwidth. So I can make all those settings and configurations. Once I've done that, then I can attach this to a host. And I don't do that here, but instead I do that for the individual servers themselves. So I have this tenant host here called WS12 primary. If I look at the properties of that host under virtual switches, we see that I have a logical switch that's assigned to it. 
and I have two different logical switches that are here. One logical switch is for the management, and that has that management adapter. Remember when I said if you're using this logical switch for both provider addresses and management, you've got to have both of those things. And then I have a provider logical switch as well, and it's using this particular adapter, and it's using this particular provider for it. So this is where I would specify that inside of there. Once I've done all that, then I can go under VMs and services and create my different VM networks. And as you can see here, I have both a finance VM network and a sales VM network. And even though they both have the same IP subnet ranges, they're gonna to be totally isolated from one another. So that quickly walks you through some of the configuration things you're going to have to look forward to inside of managing VMM. The last thing I want to show you is the service template that we have for the network virtualization gateway. In this example here, I'm going to show you that service template for Windows Server 2012, but it's, a, it's not the highly available service template, but instead it is the um, template that's set up for um, uh, just a single template. And as you can see, this template gets created where it has a virtual hard disk attached to it, and it has three different network adapters attached to it. One's attached to my infrastructure. That one's used for the provider addresses. One's attached to the external world. That's the one that's going to be masked out and, and the packets are going to be transferred out to the physical world. And one is the one that we're using for routing. So basically, the NVGRE packets will come in through this network, pass to the VM, get routed from through NIC3, under to NIC2, and then out to the physical world. And we need these three NICs, and the one NIC's not connected to anything, it's just used for routing uh, to get everything through from the virtual machines that are isolated out to the physical world. So what you basically do is you have a physical host that is managed solely for network virtualization. If I go into the fabric and we look under infrastructure, I have this WS12 gateway host, and that gateway host is only designed for network virtualization, and it is the only one that has that virtual machine service that we just showed you. Um, if we look under here, has that gateway VM, which is that service template that we created running inside of there. That's just used for managing the gateway out to the physical world. Uh, the VM here, the VMs that are running inside of this tenant, like this sales app here, would route the packets to other VMs that are running inside of here. If they need to go out to the physical world, it would go out through that WS12 gateway virtual machine that's on inside of there. So that is the end of this demo right here. And now what it will do is flip back to the presentation. We've talked now about managing compute, managing storage, managing network resources, all from within VMM. And VMM allows you to deploy bare metal servers um, for Hyper-V servers. It allows you to deploy uh, virtual machines uh, for I mean, not virtual machines, but scale-out file servers for your clustered storage environment. And then lastly, it allows you to manage and configure that logical networking and the management of your Hyper-V network virtualization all the way through gateway configuration of taking virtual machines from inside of this network virtualization environment and routing those packets out to the physical world. So we really talked in this first video all about the compute storage and networking resources. And within this compute storage and networking resources, we've given you the ability to understand how VMM manages that underlying configuring fabric. In later videos, we're going to talk about how to create a private cloud from this thing, and then lastly, the day-to-day -day operations and management of that.